Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Jesus in the Torah, part of a series, uh, both this time and next uh, episode, looking at the promised Messiah in the Hebrew Scriptures, part of our overall series on the doctrines of the Bible. Now, let me get specific here. We're looking at the specific promises of the Messiah. Sometimes he's not called that. In fact, uh, the term Messiah is not going to be used a lot in the Old Testament, but it will be there. But that's as opposed to seeing types and shadows and pictures that I think also point to Jesus. Um, but that's we're just we don't have time to look at that. That would be an entire separate series, uh, and we're not going to take time for that right now. Now, I want to turn us to Genesis chapter 3, but we're going to start in chapter 2 just to get a running start. Uh, chapter 2, verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, this is Adam, he's just been created, uh, in fact, Eve hasn't even been mentioned yet, uh, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. Uh, now, that's not talking about two different d- deaths, even though the Hebrew word, uh, for death is used twice. Uh, that's a figure of speech saying you're really going to die. So um, uh, if you want to be overly literal, you'd say die and you will die. But that all that means is it's really going to happen. Um, and the translators did a proper job of rendering it, and you shall surely or you shall certainly die. That's that's actually meant by the, the, the Hebrew phrase there. You know the story. The serpent comes out in, in chapter 3. And he tempts the woman in particular to eat from the fruit. Now, I put a picture of the apple here because I don't know what the fruit of knowledge of good and evil looks like. Um, But um, uh, he tempts and she eats and she gives to um, the man with her, to Adam with her. Uh, Where is he in that temptation? It sounds like he's with her. And he eats as well. Uh, And the temptation had been, uh, God knows that in the day you eat of it, you will be like him. You'll be like God. And the problem is that if we had started back in chapter 1, we would have seen that God already created man in his own image. There's a sense, not in every sense, but there was a sense in which mankind, the man and the woman both, uh, the male and the female, were already in the image of God. And yet um, the temptation is to, uh, to go and seek something more than what God had given. Well, verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a light to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. Now, those are things that the tree was, that it both looked like and, and really it really was those things. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also, there's her husband with her, gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Notice it did give a certain amount of experiential knowledge. Um, that's, uh, that in itself didn't make them like God. Uh, they thought it would. And, and they, um, in, fa- in fact, in a sense, they got more knowledge. And God has all knowledge, but they didn't become God. They knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Um, that's not going to work very well. If you've ever seen someone try to make a coat of fig leaves, it's not a style uh, that, has, that has caught on for good reason. Now, the question is, and I've already asked this, this in other classes, why didn't they die? Uh, and sometimes people look at that and say, well, uh, they did die spiritually. Uh, let me just say, I think that's the wrong answer. Uh, I, I do think they died spiritually, but I don't think that's the answer to why didn't they die when God said, in the day you eat of it, he didn't say 900 years later, he didn't say you begin today. He said, in the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Dying you will die. It's really going to happen. Uh, I don't think he's speaking of spiritual death because nowhere in Genesis is there any reference to spiritual death. Um, In fact, what we see all throughout Genesis is just physical death. Um, In fact, we look at Genesis chapter 5, verse 5. This is uh, um, sort of a retelling of the Adam and Eve story very shortly. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And uh, that's not spiritual death. That's just physical death. Uh, and then you read verse 8, his descendant, Seth, and he died. And then uh, that person's descendant, and he died, and he died. And it becomes a regular refrain in the story. So I don't think spiritual death is in view in this, in this promise. Why didn't they die? I think the answer is found in verse 21 where the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now, it's entirely possible, I have to confess, God could have just snapped his fingers and, and garments just appeared. But I think, and 
And the rabbis are with me on this. Uh, the Hebrew rabbis, the Jewish rabbis, uh, feel that this was the first sacrifice. I think they're right. That the Lord took an animal and killed it and skinned it. And then from that made garments of skin. That's why it was garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So it took the death of an animal. And I think that this was a uh, a picture. Now, I said we're not going to look at pictures, but this is one on the way to the prophecy. Um and so I think this is a picture of Jesus, who the idea of of a innocent substitute being sacrificed, and this is the basis of the whole future sacrificial system that comes in the rest of the Hebrew Scriptures and the rest of the Old Testament. And, of course, Jesus is our sacrifice. In fact, uh, he is described in the New Testament, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. And, and he accomplished that on the cross. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, actually connects this with the clothing theme. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. He has clothed us in himself, in his own righteousness. And, and so we find ourselves clothed in him and with him. Now, God shows up and questions the man and the woman, and the serpent for that matter, uh, and now he give, here's the prophecy. Uh, he has just turned to the serpent, and he has given a curse upon the serpent, and then he says, still to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. Let me just say for the record, uh, I think that was a serpent that was there. Uh, what, do, what did serpents look like back then? I don't know. Uh, I don't know that they looked any different, although uh, some people have, have seen maybe some sort of hint that because it talks in the previous verse, uh, on your belly you shall go. So as if to say, maybe serpents didn't go on their belly before that. But that's that's maybe theorizing too much. Um, but I do think that Satan, even though he's not mentioned anywhere in Genesis or Exodus, and actually any, anywhere in the Torah, he is mentioned later on in the in the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament, but not not here in the Torah. Um, but I think he was behind the scenes. Where do I get that from? Revelation chapter 12 talks about that old serpent, the devil, and Satan, and sort of puts all of those titles and names together uh, as the same person. Uh, so I think I say, think Satan's here, but not mentioned by name. Uh, so notice, I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to the serpent, and between your seed and her seed. This, this means this is a promise. This is a prophecy. He that's the seed of the serpent, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Sort of the imagery that's being used in this prophecy is of a man that encounters a snake and the man uh, attacks the snake or the snake attacks the man and the man takes his foot and stomps it on the head of the snake and dies. But in the process, the snake bites the foot of the man. Uh, notice the heel is mentioned. And and that's that's a that's an injurious um, bite. That's a bite that, that hurts a lot. Uh, very painful. And so there it is. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Um, the Douay Reims version. <laughs> I'm not an advocate of that translation. This is a Roman Catholic translation. Uh, says, she shall crush thy head and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. Uh, the problem is that the, the, um, the gender is very specific. He shall bruise you on the head, not she. Uh, so uh, they're they're trying to put Eve into that, uh, you know, uh, or or perhaps the Virgin Mary, and make her the hero. Uh, I don't care if you see uh, the woman as the Virgin Mary, but don't change the wording of the Hebrew text to try to prove your point. Um, and the, the woman of you here is Eve, but there's a sense in which Jesus also came through Mary. Uh, in a sense, he came through both. Uh, and that's okay to see that. I, I don't have a problem with that. But no, uh, he shall bruise you on the head. You shall bruise him on the heel. The, the, the text is quite specific on that. Now, the seed of the serpent, um, I think you have uh, some examples of that in uh, in those in the book of Genesis that sort of follow the path of the serpent. I think of Cain, uh, who killed his brother, I think of Lamech, who kills somebody a little bit later in, at the end of Genesis chapter 4. I think of others. Uh, but ultimately, I think it's speaking of Satan uh, and when we get to the New Testament. Like I said, you don't see that until you get to the New Testament. And in this imagery, 
uh, he was defeated upon the cross. So in the imagery of the of the man versus the snake, the, the head versus the heel, his head, in a sense, was bruised on the cross. That's a fatal wound. Uh, he was defeated upon the cross. Um, and then the seed of the woman, ultimately, uh, is the person of Jesus, who in this imagery, his heel, that is his humanity, uh, not that, you know, remember, he's both God and man. Um, we... we uh, we see that elsewhere, and we're going to be seeing that in a few weeks. Uh, but that humanity was bruised. Uh, he, he died upon the cross, not just bruised. He died, but that's the picture of the bruising of the heel. And like I said, if you ask, who's the woman? If you want to see Eve, you want to see Mary, um, that's okay. Maybe a little bit of both. Uh, the point is the seed, not, uh, not just who is the woman. Uh, that's not the big idea. The big question is, who's the seed? And so with, we, with regard to the serpent, with regard to Satan, his defeat is an eternal defeat. I mean, in a sense, his, he, he's still active, uh, but his time is limited because the defeat has already taken place. And likewise, the victory of Jesus. Um, his victory is eternal, but the bruising of his heel, that is his death, well, that was only temporary because he rose again from the dead. Uh, the resurrection shows that he has won the victory. Now, uh, that's Genesis chapter 3. I think it's the very earliest prophecy of, of the Messiah, of Jesus. Uh, like I said, Messiah is not mentioned. Jesus is mentioned. He's not, we don't find his, out his name until the New Testament. Next, we come to Genesis chapter 9, a, a second prophecy. Now, there were other prophecies, but not of the Messiah. But I think this one ultimately is. This one starts in Genesis chapter 9, verse 20. Uh, where Noah had come off the ark, and he began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. Now, this is sort of, sort of personal, but the, the, the story is told us in the Bible, so it's not, it doesn't stay personal. Verse 22, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Uh, now, uh, I'm not sure that seeing was the, the bad thing, but what he does is he goes and verbally uncovers his father's nakedness. He, he shames his father in this, telling his two brothers outside. And remember that, that the culture of the Middle East, the culture of the ancient world, was largely an honor and shame culture. That doesn't really resound to us. We talk more about right and wrong. They talked more about honor and shame. And, and he has just done a shameful thing. Now, as soon as you say the father of Canaan, remember the Canaanites, that's going to be big in the Israelite story. Uh, he, that's introduced here. Um, but, but that's not really uh, germane, or it's not the front and center part of our story. So let's look at the story first, and then we'll see how Canaan comes into it. So Ham reveals his father's shame. That, that's a problem. And then verse 23, but Shem and Japheth, the other two brothers, took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. So Ham had revealed his father's shame. Uh, Shem and Japheth, they take a, a, uh, a garment, some sort of clothing, and they cover their father's shame. And what's more, Notice the respect. Their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. They don't even want to look. Uh, they, they want to uh, protect his privacy and protect him. And so they place this over him. They are concealing and covering uh, what, what could have been shameful, but they're not going to partake in that. Verse 24, when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. Now, um, there, there's some folks, usually modern interpreters, uh, look at the whole nakedness thing and, and they say, there must have been something more involved. They try to read into some homosexual act. I don't think we have to do that. Um, I think they're, they're trying to read it through 21st century eyes instead of reading it through the eyes of the ancient culture and that Middle Eastern uh, ancient honor and shame sort of thing that is taking place. So I think they're missing it. Uh, but Noah wakes up, so he said, and notice he doesn't curse Ham, he curses Canaan, the son of Ham. Uh, why is this? I'm not sure, but, but it's striking that, that God had blessed Noah and his three sons. And you don't really curse somebody that God's blessed. So you know, maybe that's it. Uh, is there some other reason? If there is, we're not told that. But Canaan, remember the land of Canaan, is going to be the place that will ultimately be given to Israel. Um, and, and it starts here. Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants, or if you want to render that a slave of slaves, that would work out. 
a, a servant of servant, a slave of slaves, he shall be to his brothers. So the curse is put on Canaan. He also said, we go from cursing now to blessing, blessed be the Lord. Notice uh, Can- Canaan is cursed, but the Lord is the one who's blessed. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Now, does that mean Canaan is the servant of Shem or Canaan is the servant of the Lord? Well, that, that's sort of up in the air right now. I'm not going to even try to answer that. Verse 27, may God enlarge, and the word for enlarge here, uh, Yafet, uh, uh, it's sort of a play on words because that's also the name of Japheth. Uh, may God, uh, may God, uh, Yepheth, Yepheth, it's a tongue twister. May he enlarge Japheth. May he Japheth, Japheth. Um, and uh, so it's it's a little bit about the the meaning of Japheth's name. And in the uh, second line of verse twenty seven, this is this is the 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 one that gives trouble. In fact, I think this is the one that gives the most misunderstanding. Uh, here it is. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents. Of Shem. Now, the key interpretive question here, I think, is to whom does the pronoun refer? Let him dwell in the tents of Shem. Uh, a great many modern translators, I think, miss it here too. Even the New American Standard, and that's what that's the translation I'm using here. Notice uh, it is their practice to capitalize the the pronoun when it's referring to God, and just to leave it normally if it's referring to somebody other than God. By not capitalizing it, they're telling us that it's their opinion that the him refers to Japheth. I think they're wrong. <laughs> Let me just say it for the record. I think they're wrong. Let him dwell in the tents of Shem. And then when you ask them, well, what does it mean for Japheth to dwell, to dwell in the tents of Shem? Um, they can't come up with a single answer. They come up with a whole bunch of possibilities, and they're all sort of out in left field, and they're all very speculative and... Um, um, and they're all basically using a 21st century interpretation rather than using an interpretation that was ancient. Instead, if you read the older rabbis from, from way back, they will say, well, the him, that, that refers to God. And let him dwell in the tents of Shem. You know, to, you know how does God dwell in the tents of Shem? The answer is, well, that's what the tabernacle is all about. When God dwelled in the tents of Shem, and notice, let Canaan be his servant, uh, God's servant, you know, maybe through his representatives like like Shem and others, but this is this is God's story, and He dwells in the tents of Shem. He tents with Shem, and that's striking for the New Testament because we read in Gen- in John chapter one, uh, that chapter starts in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, sort of takes us all the way back to in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth back in Genesis 1. But we get to verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, there's a number of, uh, there's several different ways you could translate that word dwelt. And when you see it, it's usually referring to something else. But there's a there's about three or four times where it translates a term that actually means tent. <laughs> And this is one of those times. Uh, there, are, all those times are, by the way, they're all in John's writings, either here in the Book of Revelation. Um, uh, but we could actually render this, and the Word became flesh and tented among us. That's why I think uh, there is a connection here to this prophecy. And we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And in the same way that God tented among the tents of Shem, that was the tabernacle that we have one who has tented among us, uh, and that person is the one who became flesh. All right, next I want to look at a promise that is given to Abraham. So we're going to stay in Genesis. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to stay in the Torah. Uh, We're going to be a lot in Genesis. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. He goes on, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so you shall be a blessing. And then we come to verse 3, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And here it is. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, 
the New Testament quotes this passage, this promise, especially this last line in verse 3. Uh, and the script is Paul speaking, and, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, and here it is, all the nations shall be blessed in you. In what way are all the nations blessed in Abraham? There's probably a few ways, but the way that Paul points out is that it's through Abraham that the Messiah comes. And by his coming, all the families of the earth, yes, even the Gentile families of the earth, are blessed. It's not, it's not uh, exclusive to Gentiles, but they're included. They're, they're included in, in all the earth. And so uh, notice, uh, all the nations shall be blessed in you. That promise then uh, starts with Abraham. You know, in fact, uh, we see this in chapter 17, verse 1, where it's given again. Uh, and then it's passed down to Isaac in chapter 26. I'm the God of your father Abraham to, to Jacob. I'm the Lord, uh, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. Uh, and so it goes from father to son to son to grandson. Uh, to Abraham, he says, for all the land which you see, I will give to you and to your seed forever. Uh, Isaac, uh, for to you and your seed, I will give all these lands. To Jacob, he says, the land on which you lie, I will give it to you, to you and your seed. That's actually given to Jacob as he was leaving the land. But God says, don't worry, you'll be back. In chapter 13, verse 16, uh, um, God had said to Abraham, and I will make your seed as the dust of the earth. To Isaac, he says the same thing. I'll multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. To Jacob, he says, your seed also shall be like the dust of the earth. Um, and, he, and we just saw, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That was chapter 12, verse 3. Um, we see that same promise passed on to Isaac. And by your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Uh, just to, to clarify, it's not just Abraham himself, but but that promise is passed on. And then Jacob, and in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So that, that promise of the seed continues down. Verse 16 of Galatians chapter 3, uh, Paul quotes this, uh, he cites this prophecy that we've just been looking at. And he says, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one. Now, I'm not sure I would have picked up on this. I would have just assumed, okay, seed refers to sort of all of them. Uh, and Paul says, no, no, no. Uh, it's not plural, but rather to one, and to your seed, singular, that is Christ. And so I might not have picked up on this, but Paul does, and he, he points this out. Take another look at that Old Testament prophecy, because it refers to one seed, and that is the Messiah. Now, I'm turning next to the story of Abraham, who is told by God to offer Isaac upon the altar. And you know the story, uh, where God gives this command, uh, go to the place I'm going to show you and sacrifice your son, your only son, Isaac. Uh, and he says it that way because um, Abraham had had another son by a different wife, Ishmael. But he's out of the picture now. And so they travel for three days. I think it's sort of striking. Um, and they get to a place that we're going to, you know, in the land of Moriah. Now, it doesn't say Mount Moriah. It says the land of Moriah. Later on, we find out that there is indeed a mountain. That, this is in Chronicles, where we find out there is a mountain by the name of Moriah. Uh, I think the mountain and the land are the same place. Um, but uh, uh, they go up there, and they have some servants with them. But Abraham says to the servants, you stay here, and uh, Isaac and I will go up and sacrifice to the Lord, and we will come back, which... God had actually said, you're going to sacrifice your son. Um, uh, but Abraham believes, apparently, not only will we go up, but we will come back. Hebrews chapter 11 comments on this and says uh, what this means is that Abraham thought that God, he was going to sacrifice his son and that God was able to raise him from the dead. Um, and, and it's striking that Isaac carries the wood. Reminds me of somebody who carried a cross up to his place of, of uh, ex execution. Uh, well, he's bound and he's ready. And then... Uh, the angel of the Lord comes and calls to Abraham and says, uh, stop what you're doing. Uh, don't slay your son. I see that you are ready to do it. You have passed my test, uh, my loyalty test. Uh, and he lifts up his eyes. Now, this is significant. Uh, he lifts up his eyes and he sees a ram caught in a thicket, which is going to be the replacement for Isaac. And he takes the ram and kills the ram instead of killing Isaac. Remember how we said that... Um, Coats of skin. And I think that's the same idea as a replacement, as a substitute. Same thing happening here. 
Now, we read in verse 14 that Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. Um, and that's an okay translation, but that's not literal. Uh, actually, literally, it says, uh, he called the name of that place, the Lord will see. You say, well, why did they they put provide? Uh, sort of when you say, if, if I told you, hey, we're going out to eat, and I will see the lunch. That means I'm going to provide lunch. So that's the idea behind it. But literally, it's the Lord will see, as it is said to this day, in the mountain of the Lord, it will be seen. I want you to see the seen theme. Abraham looks up and he sees the ram uh, caught in a thicket, and that becomes the one that is the substitute. Now, how does that connect to Jesus? It suggests that Jesus himself connected this. In John chapter 8, verse 56, uh, he is speaking to the Pharisees. He's in the temple. And he says, your father rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it, and it was glad. Remember, seeing and providing, that's the same idea. And they hear this, and they say, wait a minute, you're only 50 years old. Abraham was like 2,000 years ago. You, uh, how, could, how could you have seen Abraham, or how could he have seen your day? And Jesus uh, responds, before Abraham was, I am. So this is this is a conversation where Jesus is pointing out his identity. But he begins by saying, Abraham rejoiced, you know, all that seeing that Abraham did, uh, all that providing. Abraham saw my day. He saw, he saw what I would provide. So this is a prophecy. This is a, uh, a prophecy and a picture of, of Jesus. Now, uh, so the last one we're going to look at in Genesis, and there are probably others that we could point out, but this is a promise given to the tribe of Judah. And the, the promise is given, it's a whole series of promises that are given to, to each of the sons of Jacob, but it comes to Judah, uh, Genesis 49, verses 8 and 9. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. There's a little play on words there because uh, the word praise is Judah, which is the, word, the name Judah. It means praise. Show Judah, your brothers shall Judah you, <laughs> or praise your brothers shall praise you. Uh, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down to you. Uh, Judah is a lion's whelp. That is why we talk about the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's, that's the idea here. Uh, from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He, he couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who dares rouse him up. You know, watch out for Judah. Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff. Now, this is parallelism, where you say it, and then you say it with different words. So the scepter and the ruler's staff are two different ways of describing the same thing. The, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, so Judah, until Shiloh, or Shiloh, I'm, I'm going to just go with Shiloh for right now, until that comes, uh, the word Shiloh is, is peace. Um, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So there's one coming, not just Judah, but somebody that comes from Judah. And notice how the scepter and the ruler's staff are connected. He's going to be the ruler. He's going to be the king. And of course, King David comes, comes through, through Judah. He comes from Judah uh, and Solomon. But I think this is a greater piece than what was given by either David or Solomon. Uh, I think this points ultimately, ultimately to Jesus. He is the, the ruler. He is the ruler. He is the King of Kings. Now, last prophecy, and this is a very short one. Um, this is uh, Moses speaking to Moses, where the Lord said to me, "They have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen, like you." He's speaking to Moses. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. That the coming one, the Messiah, yes, he would be a descendant of David. Yes, he would be a king. But more than just a king, he would also be a prophet. In fact, we see elsewhere he'll be a priest too. But we'll look at that uh, in a later prophecy. Uh, a prophet from among their countrymen like you. Now, this brings up the question, in what way was Moses different? Moses was different in that he went into the presence of God up on Mount Sinai uh, and communicated with God face to face. <laughs> you know, that doesn't happen. That, that's, that's like weird and strange. Um, and uh, the New Testament says no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten, and there's a scribal question there, is it the only begotten son or is it the only begotten God? Uh, the older manuscripts say, say only begotten God. They might not be correct. This is John chapter 1. 
Um, but uh, the the uh, more recent manuscripts say the only begotten son. That might be right. I don't know. Uh, but he has explained him. He has communicated to him. Uh, and so uh, Jesus is the one who came from the presence of God. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But he comes from God to to communicate and to speak all that God has commanded. So in that sense, he is a prophet like unto Moses.